Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lecture 15 of GPU Computing. Today, we're going to be talking about sorting. Last time, uh, we spoke about one parallel pattern, which was merge. Uh, and we said that an ordered merge is an operation where we take two ordered lists uh, and we combine them into a single ordered list. Uh, and we said that in order for us to parallelize this operation, one way to do it uh, is to divide the output list that we are about to generate into equal segments and give each thread one of these segments. Uh, and then each of these threads needs to find the corresponding input segments uh, in the two uh, input uh, matrices A and uh, input arrays A and B, uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, merge uh, those uh, two input segments sequentially. Uh, and we said that the key challenge in doing this parallel merge is basically how does each thread find the um, the corresponding uh, input segments in A and B. Uh, now, to, to do that, what we said is, you know, given uh, an index K uh, that points to an element in C uh, or a uh, the beginning of a segment uh, in C, uh, the, key, the key challenge is how do we find I and J that point to the corresponding uh, elements in A and the corresponding segments in A and B? And we call these the co-ranks. So we said that I here is the co-rank of K. Uh, and same thing, J is the core rank of K in the array B. Uh, and we observed that J is simply K minus I. So the real challenge was just uh, finding uh, I. Uh, and what we did is we set a bounds on I. Uh, and then we all, and then we said that given this bounds, we do a binary search in this bounds. And we determined the condition uh, for when our guess is correct, uh, when our guess is too high, and when our guess is too low. Uh, and these conditions were based on the observation that the element before I and A should be less than the element after J in uh, B, and similarly, the element before J in B should be less than the element after I inside of A. Uh, and then, so basically, each uh, thread that takes a segment will do a binary search to figure out I and then correspondingly find J, and then just does uh, a, uh, um, a sequential merge of the two input segments into the output segment. Uh, we'll also observe that the memory accesses uh, for this operation were not coalesced because when we do a binary search, we're doing a random access into our array, so we're not going to have coalescing. But also, after we do the binary search and identify the co-rank, when we come to do the sequential merge, each thread is merging a different input segment in the in the input array, so the the accesses during this merge are also not coalesced. Uh, so to do that, the optimization that we did is to figure out uh, the blocks, the, the segment for the entire block by one one of the threads in the block. And then the threads in the block will collaborate to load uh, that segment into shared memory in a coalesced way. Uh, and then we do the binary searches of all the different threads inside of shared memory. And then we do the merge of each thread inside of shared memory. And then we store the merged array from shared memory to global memory also in a coalesced way. And that looked like this. So here, one of the threads in the center block will determine I block and J block that correspond to the K block segment. Uh, and then the threads will collaborate to load the I block and the J block segments to shared memory here, A, S, and B, S. And then each thread will find its own, uh, each thread will determine its own output segment and figure out the correspond the core ranks in the input in segments inside of shared memory. So here one thread will find the I and the and J that correspond to its K uh, using a binary search. And then this thread will do the sequential merge inside of shared memory and then when all the threads are done merging inside of shared memory, we go back and we store C, uh, uh, we store from CS to C at K block in a coalesced manner. So this is the optimization that we did in order for us to have coalesced memory accesses. We loaded in a coalesced manner to shared memory, did the uncoalesced accesses inside of shared memory, and then stored in a coalesced manner back to global memory. Uh, one final thing I forgot to talk about last time is thread coarsening. Um, so, how the, what is the price that we pay uh, to parallelize merge in this case? Well, the price that we pay to parallelize merge is that every thread needs to uh, do its own binary search. So, the more the more threads we have, right, the more binary search operations we're doing. Uh, so, the advantage of coarsening is we have fewer binary searches. And in fact, we already applied thread coarsening by assigning multiple output elements to each thread. So in our in our previous uh, merge, we were already assigning multiple output elements to each thread. We could have 
parallelize it in a way where every output array received one, th every thread, every output element was assigned to one thread. And then every, we do a binary search for every single output element. Uh, but what we did instead is we, uh, we actually assigned every thread to a segment of the output. Uh, and um, uh, so we've already applied thread coarsening by assigning multiple output elements to each thread. Uh, now, we could have assigned a single output element to each per thread, like I said. In this case, the output segments would have had length one. The reason we didn't do that is this would have been slightly uh, less intuitive to explain. It was easier, it's easier to explain uh, merging, uh, merging, you know, multiple segments than, than merging uh, two segments where the output uh, has size one. So this is part of the reason why we explained it with coalescing already applied. Another reason is that we did have a shortage of time in the last, uh, in the last uh, lecture. Uh, so again, the price of parallelization here is the cost of performing binary search. Uh, so by not assigning each thread to a single output element, but assigning each thread to multiple output elements, per, uh, then what we do uh, is we amortize the cost of binary search over larger input segments. Okay, so this was a kind of a quick overview of what we covered last time. Uh, and today we're going to start talking about, we're going to talk about sorting, and we're going to look at two sort algorithms. We'll spend most of the time talking about radix sort, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about merge sort. Um, before I uh, begin talking about uh, sort, does anybody have any questions about what we covered last time before I uh, move on talking about sort? Okay, well, if there are no questions, uh, then let's begin talking about sorting. Uh, so we'll start with radix sort, and like I said, we're going to spend most of the time looking at radix sort, and then we'll look a little bit at merge sort uh, towards the end. Uh, so what is radix sort? Radix sort is a sorting algorithm uh, where the, the way it works is we distribute the keys that we're sorting into buckets based on a radix uh, or a base. So if the input is represent the input keys are represented uh, in some uh, base in a positional numeral system. Uh, then uh, we uh, we uh, use that base uh, and we 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 iterate over the digits and every iteration we distribute uh, the keys into buckets based on the radix. Uh, so distributing the keys into buckets is repeated for each digit in the key. Uh, and one important thing is that for every iteration we should preserve the order from the previous iteration within each bucket. So this is important, and I'll show you why this is important. Uh, and Usually, when we do a uh, radix sort uh, in uh, computers, uh, we like to use a radix that is a power of two uh, because that simplifies processing binary numbers, right? Because we're iterating over the digits uh, in the key, so it's easy to slice the key into multiple digits where the digits are uh, uh, are uh, are slices of a binary number, and that's why we like to use powers uh, of two. So each iteration is going to handle a fixed slice of bits from the key. Now, to keep things simple uh, and for the ease of illustration, we're going to start uh, by looking at a radix of two. Okay. Uh, in other words, we're going to start looking at uh, looking at the case where our radix is one bit, uh, and then we're going to extend this later on in the lecture. Okay. So we'll start by demonstrating radix sort using one bit a uh, one bit radix, and then we'll extend it. Okay. So let's get started. So if I have this array over here. And what I would like to do is I would like to sort uh, this array. Then what we would need to do is we would need to divide uh, this array uh, into uh, into bits and iterate over the bits one bit at a time because we're using a one bit radix. Okay, and every iteration what we will do is we will uh, divide our inputs into buckets based on our uh, based on our uh, radix. Uh, so somebody is asking, isn't radix sort a non-comparison based algorithm? Yes. So radix sort is a non-comparison based algorithm, as we will see, uh, and uh, that's why we're going to cover merge sort and radix sort. Merge sort is comparison based, uh, and a radix sort is non-comparison based. Uh, somebody is also asking if these uh, these elements need to have a fixed size. So yes, usually if we're sorting, we're going to assume that we, our key needs to have a fixed size so that we can divide it uh, into digits. Um, so if we're sorting 32-bit integers, then that size of our integers is obviously going to be 32 bits. Uh, in general, if our keys don't fall into this category, then we would need 
a comparison based sort, and that's where we're going to look at uh, comparison based sorts. Uh, we're going to look at merge sort towards the end. So, yes, we will look at comparison based sorts, uh, but uh, we're, we're starting by looking at radix sort, which is a non comparison based sort. So, thank you for that question. Uh, okay, so what we said is the way radix sort works is we're going to start uh, by with by looking at one of the bits, we're going to look at the least significant bit. Okay, and the least significant bit of each number, you know, some of them are going to be zero and some of them are going to be one. Uh, so what we're going to do is we are going to separate our, our keys. So these are our keys and we're going to separate our keys into two buckets based on the first bit or the least significant bit. So we're going to put all the zeros together and all the ones together. Okay, so we're going to do this. We're going to put all the zeros here at the beginning and then we're going to put all the ones after all of the zeros. Uh, and after we do this, now what we have is we have uh, the array is sorted by only the least significant bit. Okay. Uh, and now what we're going to do is we're going to repeat this process, but every time we're going to look at a different bit and we're going to go from the least significant bit to the most significant bit. So on the next iteration, we're going to look at the second bit. And next, what we're going to do is we're going to separate the keys based on the second bit. So now, Second bit, we have some of them are zeros and some of them are ones. So what we will do is we're going to put all the elements whose second bit is zero together, and then we're going to put all the elements whose second bit is one together. Okay. And one important thing over here is that when we are separating the, the when we are separating uh, the elements whose second bit is zero from the elements whose second bit is one. We are maintaining the order, the original order within each bucket. So the order of the elements inside of this bucket uh, is the same as the order of the elements in the original array. Meaning that this first element who, who that had a second digit as zero came first here. The second element that who, who had the second uh, digit bit being zero came second. The third element with the second bit being zero came third. Right? We can't take this element and put it here, and then take this element and put it before it. And the reason is that if we did that we would mess up the order from the that we got from the previous iteration. So the previous iteration sorted uh, the array by the first bit. Now the second iteration sorts the array by the second bit while preserving the order from the first iteration. And what that does, so preserving, preserving the order from the previous iteration within each bucket, what that does is that it ensures that the keys are now sorted by the lower two bits. Okay, so now if you look, our keys are sorted by the lower two bits. So we have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And then when we're done with the 0, 0, so we're going to have 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. When we're done with the 0, 1, we're going to have 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. And then when we're done with the 1, 0, we have 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. So by preserving the order, now we have an array that is sorted by the lower two bits. Okay. And then we do the same thing on the next step. So on the next step, we're going to look at the third digit now. So the third digit, we have some of them are ones and some of them are zeros. So what we're going to do is we're going to separate the keys based on the third bit. So we're going to put the elements whose third bit is zero here, and we're going to put the elements whose third bit is one over here. And again, we're going to preserve the order. So now if you look, our elements are sorted by the lower three bits. So here we have zero, 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 zero. Then we have 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. Then we have the 0, 1, 0 s together. Then the 0, 1, 1 s together. Then the 1, 0, 0 s together. The 1, 0, 1 s together, et cetera. Okay. So the keys are now sorted by the lower three bits. And the last step is to sort them by the last bit. So now we look at the most significant bit, the fourth bit. Uh, and what we do is we separate the elements based on the fourth bit. So we put all the elements. Uh, we separate the keys based on the last bit. So we put all the elements whose last bit is zero together, and then all the elements whose last bit is one together. And now we have a sorted array. So this is how radix sort works. Okay. Um, I assume that a lot of you have covered radix sort in a previous uh, course on algorithms, uh, but this was just to refresh your memory on how radix sort works. Uh, next, we're going to talk about how to do it in parallel. But before I get into that, does anybody have any questions about radix sort? Uh, so somebody's saying, how do you preserve the order without comparing? So right now I'm not talking about how we do this. I'm gonna, I'm about to talk about this, but the key, th the point is what that what we would like to do is on every iteration we would like to separate the elements based on the bit that we're interested in, 
uh, such that we have all the zeros together followed by all the ones while preserving the order. This is what we need to do. How we will do that is something that I will discuss next. Okay, but is what we need to do clear to everyone? Okay, so then the question is, uh, which you guys have already asked in the chat, how do we separate the keys based on one of the bits? And of course, while preserving the order. Okay, how, you know, I can do this in multiple iterations. So really the most important uh, question is, how do I take this input array and separate all the elements whose bit I'm interested in is zero, uh, put them to the left and then put all the bits that are, that, who, all the elements whose bits are one to the right. Okay, I'm gonna zoom in on this. And what I wanna do is uh, my problem now, I've reduced it to taking an array and separating the elements whose bits are zero to the left and the, and the elements whose bits are one, putting them also together on the right. And again, while preserving the order. Okay, now how to do it. Uh, the, the key question here, how to separate the keys is, how do I find the destination index of each element? Okay, how, for each element, I wanna take it from the original array and put it somewhere in the new array, the sorted array, right? I want to take this element at position zero, I want to put it in position zero. I want to take the element at position two, put it in position one. I want to take the element at position one and put, put it in this position. I think this is position eight. Okay, so for each one of these elements, what I need to do is I need to find where, what its destination index is in the sorted array. Okay, so the real question is, how do I find the destination index of each element in my input array? Okay, well, let's let's think about this. Let's uh, let's uh, take a look at how we can do this. So the destination. Let's first look at our zeros. The destination of our zeros is going to be the number of zeros to my left, right? So here, the first zero, the destination of this first zero is going to be zero because there are no zeros to its left. The destination of the second zero is going to be one because there is only one zero to its left. The destination of this third zero, well, this one's gonna to go to the third position in the destination array because there are two zeros to the left, right? So this is gonna go in position zero, this goes in position one, this goes in position two because we have two zeros before it, this goes in position three because we have three zeros before it, etc. Okay? It's a scan. Oh, well, we'll get to that, yes. So as you can observe, you can see where we're heading, we're heading towards scan, exactly. Okay, but let's formulate it a little bit first and then we'll see how we can uh, use scan to accomplish this. So the destination of a zero is the number of zeros to the left of the zero. Now, the number of zeros to the left of the zero is also the number of elements to the left of the zero minus the number of ones to the left of the zero, right? Because the, the elements I'm get to my left are either going to be zeros or ones. So the number of zeros to my left is the total number of elements to my left minus the number of ones to my left. Okay, so very, for example, this zero over here is in position, you know, zero, one, two, three, four, five. So this zero is in position five. So this zero has five elements to its left. Okay, I can say that the, this, the position of this zero is two because it has two zeros to its left. Or another way to figure out that this element has two zeros to its left is to count the number of ones to its left, which is one, two, three. And since I know that this element is in position five, I know there's five elements to its left. So I do five elements minus three ones, that gives me two zeros, okay? So the number of zeros to the left is the number of elements to the left minus the number of ones to the left. And the number of elements to the left is just the element of the, the index of the element, right? This element is, is, at, is at index zero and it has zero elements to its left. This element is at index one, it has one element to its left. This element is at index two, it has two elements to its left. Okay, so the number of elements to the left is basically the index of the element. So basically the destination of a zero is going to be the index of the element minus the number of ones to the left of the element. That's going to be the destination of, of the zero. Okay, clear? Questions? Okay, now let's look at the destination of the ones. So the destination of a one is going to be the number of zeros in total 
plus the number of ones to the left. So for example, if we look at this one over here, where is this one going to go? Well, this one is going to go after all of the zeros. What about this one? This one is going to go after all of the zeros and this one over here. So the destination of this one is the total number of, this, of zeros because we're going to put all the zeros first. Uh, and then uh, we're going to put this one and then we're going to put this one. So this one is going to be, uh, the position of this one is going to be the total number of zeros in the whole array, okay, plus the number of ones to the left, which in this case is one. For this element, so it's going to be the total number of zeros plus the number of ones to the left, which in this case is two. So I'm going to put all the zeros and I'm going to put these two ones and then I'm going to put this element. Okay, so by doing this, by finding the total number of zeros in total plus the number of ones to the left, this is what helps me preserve the order. Same thing here, by the way, when I do, I count the number of zeros to my left, this helps me make sure that I stay in the right order. Right? I don't uh, interfere with the zeros to my left and, and you know go behind them. Okay, so the destination of a one is the number of zeros in total plus the number of ones to the left. Now, the number of zeros in total in the whole array is going to be the number of elements in the whole array minus the number of ones in the whole array. Okay, so the number of zeros in total is going to be the number of elements in total minus the number of ones in total. Okay? And then the number of elements in total is basically the size of the input array, which I should have. And the number of ones in total is basically the number of ones to the left of the last element. Okay, the number of ones to the left of the last element. Okay. Well, not necessarily. If the last element was zero, it's going to be the kind of the total number of ones. So, uh, so it's so. But but the point is that by figuring out the total number of ones to the left of each element, I can figure out the to the number of ones in total. Okay. So then the destination of a one is the input size minus the number of ones in total plus the number of ones to the left. So here, what I've done is I've de defined the destination of a zero in terms of the index of the the destination of a zero element in terms of the index of the element which I trivially have and the number of ones to the left of an element, and I've defined the destination index of a one in terms of the input size which I trivially have and the number of ones to the left of an element and the number of ones in total which I automatically get when I find the number of ones to the left of each element. Okay, so the, really the remaining problem here is to just find the number of ones to the left of each of the elements inside of this array. If I can find the number of ones to the left of each element inside of this array, I can then easily find the destination of each zero element in the array and the destination of each one element in the array. Okay? So if I want to find the number of ones to the left of each element in the array, what pattern have we seen before that allows us to do that? Somebody has already said it. An exclusive, an exclusive scan. Right, an exclusive scan, exactly. So if I want to find, if I want to just count how many ones are to my left, I can simply do an exclusive scan uh, that does this count for me. So I will use an exclusive scan. Okay, and by the way, we're not going to write code in today's lecture just because most of what we're going to be doing is based on patterns that we've already seen before and that we've already implemented before. Uh, implementing sort is basically putting together a bunch of the previous patterns that we've seen. Uh, so that is why I'm not going to be implementing any code just for the sake of time for today's lecture, but we're going to be basing it on patterns that we already saw and we already know how to implement. Okay. Professor? Yes. Uh, since, we, since we're putting things in a bin, uh, two, two bins, uh, so uh, would it, isn't it a bit similar to the histogram, so we can parallelize it maybe this oh, way? It, no, it's different. In histogram, we're not putting things in bins, we're counting things. So in histogram, each bin just is counting how many elements uh, fall into that bin. Over here, we're not, we're not counting, we're actually moving things around and placing them physically inside of a location. So we need to calculate the location that we need to place them in. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So we're not we're not just counting elements. We're actually uh, placing elements physically inside of uh, different uh, buckets. 
Okay. Um, so then, uh, now we, so now basically we, what we need to do is we have to figure out the number of ones to the left. Once we have the number of ones to the left of each element, we, we can find the destination of our zeros and the destination of our ones. Let's, let's do this. So here uh, I have my, my uh, array. Okay. I have the bit that I'm interested in, in each uh, here. The, the, in this case, it's the first bit, but this could be the second bit. It could be the third bit. It could be the first bit, et cetera. The first step is basically to extract the bit that I'm interested in. Okay. So for the zero, I'm just going to have a zero for the ones. I'm just going to have a one. So you're just going to have an array of zeros and ones. Now, this array is going to tell me if something is a one or not. Now, if I want to calculate that for each element, the number of ones to the left, what do I do? Well, simply, I'm going to do an exclusive scan on this array. If I do an exclusive scan on this array, what now I, ha what now I have is the number of ones to the left of each element in this array. Right over here, for this element, this one has one to its left. How do I do that? How do I figure that out? Well, I simply add zero and one. Okay, and that tells me that this element has a total number, of, has one one to its left. This element has one, two, three ones to its left. How do I know that? Well, if I simply add all the, all the zeros and ones before it, I have one plus one plus one, that's three. Okay, so I figure out that this element has three ones to its left. Okay, et cetera. Okay, so I extract the bit, I do an exclusive scan, and this exclusive scan tells me the number of ones to the left of each element. And then once I've done that, what do I do? Well, I simply apply uh, the, I, I use the expressions I derived earlier to find the destination of each zero element, and the destination of each one element. So the destination of each zero is going to be the element index minus the ones to the left. So for example, this zero element is going to be uh, the, the index of this element, which is five, right? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, minus the number of ones to the left, which is three. So that's how I find out that the destination of this element is two. Okay, same thing, same thing for all the other zero elements. As for the ones, the destination of the one is going to be the input size minus the total number of ones plus the number of ones to the left. So for example, this element over here, Okay, we know that this element has two ones to the left, one, two, and we also got that from the exclusive scan. Well, my total input size is 16 in this case, and the total number of ones I have in the whole array is eight, right? I got that from the end result of the exclusive scan. Okay, so 16 minus eight is eight. That means I have eight zeros, and then I simply add two to eight to figure out that this element should go at position 10. Why 10? Because I have eight zeros that need to go before this element, and then I have two ones that need to go before this element. So eight plus two is 10. All right, is it clear how I found the destination of each element using exclusive scan? Any questions about this? Doctor, the partial sum of, you know, the number of one, total number of ones, uh, it can be nine here, you know, and if the last element was one, Set, I, since it's the exclusive scan set, I would need the partial sum, right? Not the last. What element. you're saying is, I, what you're saying is, I will also need the total sum. Yeah. So after I do an exclusive scan, right? So if this was a one over here, uh, then I would have a nine. So if you remember when we did the exclusive scan, we actually had the total sum. We found it yeah. and we put it aside uh, because because we uh, we were not uh, we we're not going to use it immediately. Okay. So yes. Uh, we do need the total sum, and when we do the exclusive scan, we are going to find the total sum, and we're going to remember it so that we can use it. You're absolutely right. Okay? So the only point that I'm making is that I don't need to do a separate operation to find the total number of ones. By simply doing the exclusive scan, I can find the total number of ones on my way. Okay? Clear? All right, great. So then. Once I find the destination of each input, if each input element, then simply what I do is I take each of these input elements and store it in the output array at its corresponding destination. So this element, I found that its destination is zero. So I take it and I store it at point position zero. For this element, I found the destination is eight. So I take it and I store it at position eight. For this element, I found the position, destination is 12. So I take it and I put it at position 12. 
for this element, I found that the destination is five. So I take it and I store it at position five. Uh, professor, can you repeat how we got the destination array? Yes, so can I repeat uh, how? Okay, uh, do you uh, mean, I, can I repeat how I, how I derived these expressions? Or do you want to repeat, uh, should I repeat how I did the uh, extracted within the exclusive scan? No, just, just that step. I understand how we got number of ones to the left. Uh, I okay. just, uh, I didn't make the connection between those do you, two arrays. Do you, under, do you understand how we got, uh, so these are, these are the two expressions that we use to get this array, right? We check, we, yes, I, I understand the, we apply the first expression. If this is a one, we apply the second expression. So is your question, how did I arrive at these expressions? No, how we got the destination array is we just apply the expressions. Yeah, we just apply the expressions. So if something I, I have, if I know if something is a zero or a one. If it's a zero, I apply this expression. If it's a one, I apply this expression. Professor, can we repeat how we derive the second expression, the destination of the one? Yes. Let's, let's. So you want me to repeat how we how we arrived at this expression for the destination of a one? So let me repeat that. Sure. Uh, one second, let me go to the slide that I want. Okay, so uh, we said that the destination of a one is the number of zeros in total plus the number of ones to the left. Is this part clear? Yes, yes it's clear. Okay. The number of zeros in total is the number of elements in total minus the number of ones in total. Is that part clear? Yes. Okay. And then the number of elements in total is basically the size of my input. Okay. And then, then that's the size of my input minus the number of ones in total plus the number of ones to the left. Oh, okay. And we okay, just apply it to the array so we can get the destination. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. So that's how we arrived at the second expression. And once and you know, once we have the destination, we can simply store the element at the destination that we care about. Okay. By the way, this may not necessarily be the best thing, uh, the best approach at doing it sequentially. So I'm but I'm explaining an approach to doing radix sort, and then we will talk about how to parallelize this. Okay, so yeah, so somebody's asking about about shared memory and global memory, all these things. So let's let's hold on. You know, I'm not talking about paralyzing. I'm just talking about a logical approach to doing this. And actually, next step, I'm going to talk about paralyzing. So so that brings me to my next step. So how do we paralyze this? Well, extracting the bit is quite so simple, right? We know how to do a paralyzed scan. Here, we're just applying an expression to each element in an array. So we know how to paralyze each of these individual steps. Okay, so to parallelize this, what we can do is we can simply assign one thread to each element in our input array. Okay, and we already know how to parallelize scan and the rest is just is trivial. So we assign a thread to each element in our input array. Each of these threads will extract zero or one for the element that it's responsible for. The threads will collaborate to perform an exclusive scan. We've seen how to do that. And then each thread will find, you know, the destination index of its element based on whether its element is a zero or a one. And then once each thread finds uh, the destination of the element that it's responsible for, the thread takes that element and stores it uh, in the destination array. Okay, is it clear how we parallelize it? Simple enough. Yes, but uh, professor, I had a question. Yes. On on, on this. Since we're using only one bit of, like with the comparators, are we using 32 bit comparators to compare one bit? Uh, so we're not doing any comparison here, right? This is not no, but I mean, to, to, to add. I mean, not, yeah, we're not doing comparisons, but like to add zero and one to do the exclusive scan. We will uh, okay. be using. So, like, I, I see. Your so you can use a bitwise 
and operation to extract the, the one bit that we care about. Okay. Uh, and then based on that bitwise and, if you get a zero or a one, you would store zero or one as an integer here so that when you do the scan, uh, you actually, uh, you're going to need to sum these up. Oh, I see. Okay. And the end is just for one bit. Uh, yeah, so uh, you can extract if you if you uh, if you want if you have a 32-bit number, for example, and you want to extract one bit in that 32-bit number, you can do that using a bitwise n. Right, but that will that won't that be a 32-bit gate where like we use a 0001 as in like. I mean, how how the hardware does it is is kind of a is a different issue. Right, but uh, yes, there will be an ALU in the hardware that's going to do a bitwise, uh, a bitwise and operation, right? I see, but it's not like the number is trimmed to be one bit. It's still thirty-two bits, but we're just extracting by using an by doing an and, right? Uh, yes, yes. So the number is a thirty-two bit integer, or it could be a sixty-four bit integer. It could be a sixteen bit integer, an eight bit integer, right? Maybe we're sorting characters. Okay, so this could be any any number of bits. Okay, but we're going through it one bit at a time. Okay, so in each iteration, we're going to use a bitwise and to extract the specific bit that we care about. I see. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so now we have we know how to parallelize radix sort. Okay, so as we've been doing all previous lectures, once we learn how to parallelize something, the next step is to observe what is not efficient about what we're doing here and how can we optimize it. So what's not efficient about about what we've done so far? So extracting the bit that's embarrassingly parallel, right? Every thread is doing its own operation without without affecting any other thread. It's a local operation. Scan. We already looked at how to how to optimize scan, and then based, given a number, you're just calculating whether it's a zero or whether it's a one. So that's straightforward. But then you have to take these values and you have to store them into uh, the the uh, destination array. Okay. So but I guess my input here is is in global memory, right? And my output is also going to be some global memory array, right? So what is what is going to be inefficient uh, in this entire procedure? The stores are not coalesced. Right, exactly. The stores are not coalesced. So after all these threads finish doing all this stuff. We're going to have the stage where all the store, all the threads now are trying to store to arbitrary locations in the destination array. And just to emphasize that, if we look at this first thread block over here, again, obviously thread blocks are larger than four threads. We're going to have maybe 1,024 threads um, and, you know, a, a warp is 32 threads, but we'll just have you know, four threads for simplicity here. Okay, you'll notice that this first thread is storing to this location here. But then the second thread, which is most likely going to be in the same warp, is storing all the way over here. And then this third thread comes back and stores over here. And then this fourth thread comes and stores all the way over here. Okay, so our thread, our axes, our, our stores are not coalesced. You know, each the adjacent threads are going to very distant locations in global memory. All right. So the, store, the challenge here is that the stores are not coalesced because nearby threads write to distant locations in global memory. So having observed this, what can we do to optimize coalescing? Uh, make threads uh, responsible for output elements instead of input. So we're going to make threads responsible for output elements. Uh, but that that's a little bit difficult, right? Because if you make a thread responsible for an output element, how's the thread going to go and find the input element that it's responsible for? That's quite challenging. Yes, I'm just giving ideas. <laughs> no, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a worthy idea. Thank you for suggesting. What if we saw? Actually, one thing you can do is you can, you can invert the array, but that will require an uncoalesced access anyway. Right, so somebody is saying mm -hmm. what we can do is we can sort locally in shared memory and then write each bucket to global memory in a coalesced manner. So if you look at over here, uh, these threads that are in this block, even though their axes are not coalesced, they're all over the place. If you look at the 
total amount of global memory locations that uh, this entire thread block is writing to, you'll notice that we have we have two kind of distinct locations. We have the zeros that are being written to the zero bucket, and we have the ones that are being written to the one bucket. Okay. So as one of you suggested, what we can do is rather than writing out these zeros and ones in an uncoalesced way to global memory, we can separate the zeros and ones locally in shared memory, and then we can write the zeros all together from shared memory to global memory, and the ones all together from shared memory to global memory. Okay, so this is what we can do to improve the coalescing. Okay, so let's see what that, this would look like. So what we will do. Uh, is we're going to start by sorting locally. So the threads in this block, right, they will take their elements and they will split them inside of shared memory. Okay. And all the other thread blocks will do the same. Each thread block will have its own shared memory array that it will use to split the threads. So it's hard to split the elements. And now that I've done this, with e within each thread block, Within the shared memory of, that each block is accessing, my my zeros are now together and my ones are now together. Here, my zeros are together, my ones are together. Here, my zeros are together, my ones are together. My zeros are together, my ones are together. So now that we've done this, the next question is: Now each thread block wants to come and take its zeros and put them in global memory, and then take its ones and put them in global memory. Okay, by the way, there's another benefit of doing this because, because, uh, uh, well, yeah, the main benefit is that we are separating the zeros and ones who are we're doing our uncoalesced accesses to shared memory. Also, here we're just doing a scan locally now, uh, and uh, in order for us to do the separation, right? Remember, because if for us to do the separation, we need to do a scan. So now the, the, the scan, right, is, is being done locally within the thread block. Okay, but we will need another scan uh, to be done globally, but it's going to have fewer elements. Okay, so now each thread block is going to do a scan to do the separation locally. Now each thread block needs to know where it needs to write uh, each bucket. So each th where, the question now remains, where should each block write each bucket? Well, let's take a look. This first block over here, it has two zeros and it has two ones. The second block also has two zeros and two ones. The third block has one zero and three ones. This one has three zeros and one one. So every block is going to have a different number of zeros and ones. Now this first block needs to put its two zeros in the beginning at position zero. And then this block needs to put its zeros square at position two because there are two uh, zeros before. This block needs to put its zero at position four because it has two blocks over here, two zeros here and two zeros in this block. This block needs to put its zeros at position five because it has two zeros here two zeros here and one zero here. So it needs to put its uh, result after that. So what do I do to figure out where each thread block needs to put its zeros? Same thing for its ones. So how did I know that this thread block needs to put its zeros at position four? I counted the number of zeros in the previous two blocks. Can we create a global variable to count uh, at which position we are right now? I know how many positions uh, after uh, a certain block we need to put it at. Uh, uh, is one global variable enough? How will one global variable help you uh, help you do that? Or or two? Uh, I'm not sure. So we will have to put can something. Can we just do scan again? What is, what is but, the operation? Uh, we'll, we'll talk about how we can do it. But what's the operation that we need to do? Can we just do scan again, but with these numbers instead of zero right, and absolutely. one? Absolutely. Right. So what we will do is we, now we need to do a, another scan, right, but this time the scan is over these these numbers over here. For this block, we need to count the number of four zeros in the previous two blocks. For this block, we need to count the number of zeros in the previous three blocks. Okay. For the ones, like for this one over here, I need to count the total number of zeros. So this and this and this and this. To, in order for me to know where I put these ones. For these ones, I need to find the total number of zeros, so this and this and this and this, and I need to find the total number of ones in the previous, okay, et cetera. So what we can do is we can take these numbers, we can store them in global memory, 
So here I have an array in global memory where I have for each block, I'm going to have the number of zeros in that block and then the number of ones in that block. Okay. And then for the zeros, I basically want to find the number of zeros in the previous blocks. For the ones, I want to find the total number of zeros and the number of ones in the previous. So what do I do on this on this uh, this array? I just do a prefix sum or an exclusive sum. Okay, so I can th think of this array like this as a 1D array. For the zeros, I need to kind of find the number of zeros in the previous blocks. For the ones, I need to know that all the number, all the zeros in all the blocks plus the number of ones in the previous. So I do an exclusive scan on this array. And with this exclusive scan, now what I have uh, is you know, if, I, if I go back and I look at this array again as, as a table like this, now I have for each block the destination of the zeros in that block and the destination of the ones in that block. Okay. So then all of these blocks are gonna are gonna are gonna put these values uh, in in somewhere, and then they're gonna do a scan on these values, and then we're gonna bring back these numbers. And now each block knows for each of its buckets where it needs to put uh, the, the 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 zeros or the ones in that bucket. So this block knows that it needs to put these two zeros at position zero, starting at position zero. This block knows that it needs to put these two zeros starting at position two. This block knows that it needs to put this zero starting at position four. Okay. And same thing for the one. Okay, so once I know that, now each block can come and it can take its zeros or, it, or its ones and store them to global memory. Okay. So now each block comes and it will take its zeros and ones and it'll store them to global memory. And as you can tell, now our accesses are coalesced. Why? If we zoom in on what this first thread block is doing, uh, this thread block has separated all its zeros and its ones, and then all the zeros are, are going to go to share it to to one to this position in global memory, and all the ones are going to go to this position in global memory, and because all the zeros are next to each other, followed by all the ones, the threads that are next to each other are all are all going to be writing to nearby locations in global memory. Remember before before we did this, this thread was writing a zero and this thread was writing a one and then this thread was writing a zero and then this thread was writing a one. Now we don't have that. Now the first half of the threads in my block are all writing zeros and then second half, not necessarily half, they could be because the, the number of zeros and ones is not necessarily uh, equal, right? But the first part of, the, you know, the first partition of threads in my block is going to be writing uh, all, all writing zeros to the same global memory locations, and the remaining partitions of threads in my block are all going to be writing ones to, to global memory locations. Uh, so by doing this, we have better memory coalescing. Okay, is this clear to everyone? Any questions? So now the stores are coalesced because nearby threads write to nearby locations in global memory. Okay, uh, sir. Yeah. Just is is this is this extra step uh, actually worth it? Because it seems like you lose a lot of time doing a sc the scanning over again. Uh, I mean, uh, so two things. Uh, you have the local scan and you have the global scan, right? You're gonna do the global scan anyways. So when you're when you did it when you uh, when you were doing it without this local approach. Uh, when you did a scan across all of the elements, you were doing a local scan in the, inside of each block, and then you had to do a global scan. So we haven't really increased the number of steps. We're still doing a local scan, but this time we do a local scan and we partition, and then we get the total numbers, and then we do a global scan. So okay, scan we haven't increased the number of steps in terms of uh, the, the amount of work we do to do the scan. Uh, however, yes, we did. We have increased the overall amount of work that we're doing. However, uh, we've we've saved a lot on the memory coalescing. We've significantly reduced the number of uh, memory requests that we need to make. So okay. yes, it turns out it turns out that yes, this approach is definitely worth it. Okay, just imagine what happens to my memory system when all my threads and all my blocks are all of a sudden 
writing at the same time to all these different random locations. You can imagine this is going to put a lot of stress on my memory system. So what I end up doing is I end up, you know, just sitting there spending a whole amount of time just waiting for these memory requests to complete. Instead, it, it is actually rather than just sitting there and waiting for the memory, it is actually worth doing a little bit more work in order for you to be able to make sure that your rights to the to memory are uh, are nice and well behaved. Okay, and by the way. We are, we are just talking about radix of one here. So now we've, we're, we're only seeing the case where we have two buckets inside of the block. Okay, but next, and we're about to talk about that next. Uh, if I have multiple buckets or more than two buckets, so if my radix is greater than one bit or it's greater than two, I'm gonna ha I can have four buckets. I can have eight buckets. Okay, the more buckets I have, the more of these, uh, you know, the more of these uh, uncoalesced accesses uh, I can get. So if I go back, so I have you know this thread writing to this place, this thread writing to this other place. Okay, but then you know all the threads they're either gonna write here or here. So within a single warp, I'm probably gonna have two different requests, one to the zero bucket, one to the one bucket. But if I use a radix that is larger than two, you know, if I use a radix uh where I have maybe four buckets or eight buckets, then I could have one warp writing to uh you know four or eight different memory locations. Which means that uh, I, I can, every warp is going to have to be served using eight different memory requests. So that's where applying this optimization is actually definitely uh, worth it. Okay, is that clear? Yes, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, sorry, when yes. you mean uh, uh, two buckets, you know, it's a binary uh, when it's eight buckets, for example, it's octal. Uh, yeah, actually, let me. I'm. I'm gonna look at. I'm gonna look at this. This case next. Hold your okay. questions about having multiple buckets because we're about to cover that example. But does anybody have questions on this before I move on? Somebody's asking about coarsening. Yes, we're gonna look at coarsening, but let's wait a little bit. Professor, I was wondering, how do you make the threads wait while the global scan is happening? So there's two ways. Uh, one way is to uh, is to actually terminate the kernel and then launch it again. And if you were to do that, you would actually have to write out your shared memory to global memory and then read it back from global memory. But those those writes and those reads will be coalesced. Okay, so uh, so that's that's one way. Another way is there are actually you know fancy tricks that you can play uh, in order for you to uh, to do a global scan and have all the thread blocks communicate uh, with each other. If you know what you're doing, you can actually have different thread blocks communicate with each other, but that's an advanced uh, technique that we, we, uh, we, we, we haven't looked at yet, okay? So, so don't worry about that. It's a very good observation that you made, um, uh, but you know, don't worry about, uh, about that. And this is another reason why I didn't wanna write code for this lecture, just because some of these things uh, start getting a little bit complicated. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so now let's talk about the choice of radix value. So, so far we used a one bit radix or we used a radix of two. And what that means is that if I have a, a 32 bit key, right, my keys are 32 bits, then I'm gonna need 32 iterations to do the radix sort. In general, I will need N iterations uh, uh, if my keys are N bits long. So what can we do to reduce the number of iterations? Well, what we can do is we can use a larger radix. Okay, so a larger radix can also be used, and the advantage of a larger radix is that I have a fewer, a smaller number of iterations, so I might finish more quickly. But what is the disadvantage of using a larger radix? I kind of mentioned it already. Um, there's a higher chance that the stores are not going to be coalesced. Right, exactly. So. And the disadvantage of a larger radix is I have more buckets. So there's more buckets that I need to write from shared memory to global memory. So there's more distinct locations I need to write to. So this results in poorer coalescing as I'm about to show. So then when we choose the radix, 
okay, when we choose the radix, the choice of the radix value must balance between two things. We must balance between the number of iterations and the coalescing behavior. We want to have a large enough radix value so that we have a reasonable number of iterations, but we don't want to make it too large such that the coalescing starts to hurt our performance. Okay. How do we do the scan with a higher radix? Uh, let's let's take a look at that. So let's now uh, look at the example of a two-bit radix. So let's say I have a this uh, input array over here, and instead of using a one-bit radix, I'm going to use a two-bit radix. Okay, so what the way I do is I start. Uh, I'm going to look at the lower two bits. Okay, and so they're either going to be zero zero or zero one or one zero or one one. OK, and now I'm going to take these elements and I'm going to divide them into four buckets. OK, so I'm going to put all the zero zeros together, all the zero ones together, all the one zeros together, and all the one ones together. OK, and then what I will do is I will now, uh, in the next iteration, I will look at the next two bits, so the upper two bits. OK, and again, I am going to uh, separate them into four buckets. I'm going to put all the zero zeros together, the zero ones together, the one zeros together, and then the one ones together. Okay, so here, uh, as you can see, we need few iterations. Uh, for a two bit radix, we need n over two iterations for n bit cubes. All right, so we need fewer iterations. So this is the advantage of using a larger radix. But now let's look at the disadvantage. Let's look at how the larger radix affects coalescing. So let's zoom in and focus on just one of these iterations. Okay. And let's say I do the same thing that I wanted to do before. I'm going to assign a thread block to each, uh, what, uh, I'm going to assign a thread to each one of these input elements. So, and then inside of each thread block, I'm going to uh, take these elements and I'm going to separate them. I'm going to sort them locally. So I'm going to separate them into buckets locally. And then I'm going to do a global, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, I'm going to do the global uh, 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 separation. So here when I sort locally, so one of you asked, how can I divide these elements into four buckets as opposed to uh, just two? We saw how to calculate the index of each of these elements when there was just zeros or ones. How can we, how can we do the separation? Uh, when I have uh, I want to have uh, a radix of multiple elements. Well, it turns out the best way to do this is actually to just use multiple one bit steps. So if you remember when we when we did uh, the different iterations of radix sort, after the first when we did the one bit version, after the first iteration, the elements were sorted by the first bit. After the second iteration, the elements were sorted by both the first and the second bit. Then after the third iteration, they were sorted by the lower three bits and, and it kept on going. So if we want to do this locally, what we can do is we can use two one bit steps in order for me to do a two bit separation of my uh, sorting element. But the nice thing here is that I'm not doing these two one bit steps globally. I'm only doing the two one bit steps locally. And that's much cheaper because that means uh, the, the each one bit step is going to be its own scan, okay? But I can I, the, the, these two consecutive scans are both going to be local with, within the thread block, so I don't have to synchronize across all the other blocks. Is that clear? Is it clear how two one bit scans give me a two bit scan? Sorry, sorry, a two one bit radix sorts give me gives me a or two one-bit separations give me a two-bit separation. Okay. Can you repeat? And then all the other thread blocks are... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, I'm asking you to re repeat. Okay. Let me go back and show you something. Before, uh, when we did the separation by the first bit, okay, and then what we did is we separated keys by the second bit. So because we preserved the order here, what happens? You'll notice that over here, these elements are sorted both 
the lower two bits. So these elements are sorted. We have all the zero zeros together, and then all the zero ones together, and then all the one zeros together, and then all the one ones together. So when we do two one bit sorts, that's equivalent to doing one two bit sort. But if I want to separate my the elements in my array into four buckets for zero 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 one one zero and one one, I can do that by doing two consecutive one bit separation. Is that clear? Yes, yes, that's clear. Yeah. So this is exactly what we do. Uh, oops, that's not the file that I want to go to. Okay. So here, what we do is uh, to, in order for us to separate our elements into uh, these these uh, these four buckets. So uh, what we can do is we can do two consecutive one bit steps uh, to give us the effect of a sing of, of a single two bit step. So then each thread block is going to locally apply uh, two scans, right, to do the, these two one-bit steps in order for us to sort uh, into uh, four buckets. So each thread block is going to do the same. And then now each thread block needs to find out which bucket it needs to write to. So how do we do that? Same as before, no? Right, same as before, but this but time... But we have four have rows instead of uh, mm -hmm. two. Right, exactly. Same as before, but this time we have more buckets. So now, for each thread, we have the number of zero, zero. For each block, we have the number of zero, zeros, the number of zero, ones, the number of one, zeros, the number of one, ones. The zero, zeros, to know, to know where I'm going to put my zero, zeros, I need to find the number of zero, zeros before me. To know where I want to put my zero, ones, Okay, I need to find the number, the total number of zero zeros and the number of zero ones before me. To know where I want to put my one zeros, I need to find out the total number of zero zeros and the total number of zero ones and the total number of one zeros before me, etc. So each thread block is going to store its number of zeros, the number of zero zeros it has, the number of zero ones it has, the number of ones. It has the number of ones it has. And then we take this array, we look at it as if it's a flattened array. We do an exclusive scan on this array. So now for each element, for this element, these elements here, they're going to have the number of zero zeros in the previous block. For these elements here, we're going to get the number of zero zeros in the previous, in all the blocks, and the number of zero ones in the previous block. For these elements, we have the number of zero zeros in all the blocks, plus the number of zero ones in all the blocks plus the number of one zeros in the previous blocks. For these elements, we're going to have the number of zero zeros and zero ones and one zeros in all the blocks and the number of one ones in the previous block. Okay, so then this array over here, we go back, look at it like this. This is going to give us the destinations of the zero zeros, the zero ones, the one zeros, and the one ones for each thread block. So we send these back to the blocks and now each block knows where it needs to write out each of its buckets. So having done that, what we do is each thread block will take uh, its buckets and it'll write them out to global memory. And as you can tell, these writes will be coalesced. So if we look at this thread block, for example, uh, the zero ones, the, the nearby thread block, nearby threads will be writing out nearby elements to nearby locations in global memory. Okay. So I have uh, so, Yes, go ahead. Sorry, uh, I just wanted to say there is a, if we go too far, there will be a decrease in coalescing. If we increase the rate, it's Ab the number absolutely, of absolutely. And absolutely, and that's exactly the point. The more we increase the radix, the fewer iterations we have. However, the worse our coalescing becomes, because now instead of only having to write out two, uh, two buckets, now I need to write out three or four buckets. Okay, so obviously, if, if a thread block needs to write out to four different global memory locations, I'm going to have more places where I don't I don't have good coalescing than if I just have to write out to two distinct memory locations. Okay, but if we do, for example, something like uh, 
a third course in ink, we will improve actually a lot more than if we had uh, only two buckets, right? Well, we will do both actually. So that's that's actually my next uh, my next topic is thread coarsening. So uh, as you can see, uh, we said that by improving uh, by increasing the radix, we make uh, we reduce the number of iterations, but we make coalescing work coalescing worse. So one way that we, so obviously we're going to need to find the sweet spot. You know what is the best radix value that that has gives me a good number of iterations, but at the same time doesn't hurt coalescing too much. But another way that we can optimize coalescing is, as you said, through thread coarsening. So here for radix sort, the price yes, of parallelization across more blocks is that e e the more blocks I have, the fewer elements I have per block, and therefore the fewer elements I'm going to have per bucket per block, and therefore the fewer opportunities I have for coalescing. So if if again if these all these blocks are running in parallel, great. If these blocks are going to be serialized. I might as well give each block more work so that each block has larger buckets so that each block has better coalescing opportunities. So if I process more elements per block, this will result in larger buckets per block and hence better coalescing. So let's take a look at what that looks like here. If rather than giving each thread one element, so if this block of four threads has four elements, I'm going to give the block twice as many elements as it has threads. So each block is going to be responsible for more keys. Here I'm doing this is this is the thread coarsening step. And now what this block will do is it's going to again, you know, it's going to do it's going to do the uh, the the scan and and figure out the destinations, and then it's going to separate the buckets in shared memory, right? This other block will also do the same thing in parallel. So each block separated into its buckets and shared memory, and then finally each thread block will go and will write out the buckets to global memory. And now what you can see this time is that we have better coalescing because now our buckets are larger. So now when we write out the buckets from shared memory to global memory, our co our accesses are more coalesced. Here we can have the thread block first write out these two buckets and then write out these two buckets, but each time the accesses will have more better coalescing. Okay? Clear? Is it clear to everyone? Any questions? Okay, so this was Radix sort. The next uh, sort is merge sort, and I know that I only have a few minutes left in the lecture, but this will not be that. Uh, th this will not take that long because we've already covered merge last time. So Radix sort is not applicable to all kinds of keys, as you guys observed. Uh, sorry, somebody has a question. Uh, concerning bus level. Um... So each kernel will handle one unbit radix operation to the fullest, and we'll need uh, like I don't know bits and number divided by the divided by n kernels. Yes, of course. If we're gonna if we're gonna have uh, if we're gonna have, for example, thirty two bit integers and two bit uh, radix, then we're gonna need to have sixteen iterations. So we'll need to have sixteen separate kernel calls, one for each iteration. Okay, and depending how we implement it, we might need multiple kernel calls for each iteration. Okay. 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 Yeah. So this is a more complex pattern than the ones that we've uh, we've seen before, and that's again part of the reason why I didn't want to spend time in the lecture writing code because the lecture there's already enough material to uh, discuss without uh, without uh, presenting the code to you. Uh, so radix sort, like we said, is not applicable to all keys, as you guys observed earlier in the lecture. Okay. So we we still need to have some kind of Comparison based sort uh, that is also amenable to parallelization. And one popular one is merge sort. Uh, so, the way merge sort works is that it divides uh, a list into two sublists and then sorts the sublist and then merges them. Okay, it's a divide and conquer algorithm. Let's take a look at how merge sort works. The way merge sort works is I take my array, I divide it into many, many small pieces, you know, small subarrays. Okay, I sort each of these subarrays. You know how I sort them doesn't matter. I might sort them using merge sort, or I might sort them using some other sort. Okay, and then once I have all these sorted arrays, I merge the nearby arrays. So I'm going to merge these two. I have two sorted arrays. I'm going to merge them into one sorted array. I have these two sorted arrays. I'm going to merge them into one sorted one. I have these two. I'm going to merge them into one sorted one. I have these two sorted arrays. I'll merge them into one sorted one. Okay, 
Now I have these four sorted arrays. Now I'm going to do merge again. So I'm going to take these two arrays and I'm going to merge them into one sorted array. And I'm going to take these two and I'm going to merge them into one sorted array. Okay. And then finally, I do a final merge where I take my two uh, sorted arrays and I merge them into one final sorted array. Okay. So this is how merge sort works. How do we, how can we paralyze this? How can we paralyze merge sort? So you guys already know how to paralyze merge, so right? It's the same thing. Right. Exactly. So what we can do is we can we can paralyze each of these steps. Okay. So each step performs a different merge operation in parallel and also paralyzes each merge operation. We've already seen how to paralyze a merge operation. So for example, we'll assign. Uh, we can assign a thread block, for example, to each one of these uh, segments. The thread block will sort the segment locally somehow. Okay, using some kind of sort algorithm. And then once we have these sorted segments, on the next iteration, we can assign two blocks to sort to to uh, this output array to merge these two input segments. We can assign these two blocks to this output segment to merge these two input segments. We can assign these two blocks to this output segment to merge these two input segments, and we can assign these two blocks to each this output segment to merge these, these two input segments. And like we saw in the merge lecture, these two blocks will have to find their co-rank inside of each of these input segments in order for them to do the merge. On the next iteration, we'll assign four blocks to this input segment, and then each of these blocks will find its co-rank in this, uh, in, sorry, we'll assign these four blocks to this output segment, and each of these blocks will find its co-rank in each of the input segments and do a merge. Similarly, we'll assign these four blocks to this output segment, and each block will do uh, will find its co-rank and do a merge. And then in the last iteration, we will assign all these blocks to this entire input se output segment, and each block will find its co-rank in the input segments to do a merge. So in the earlier steps, we have more parallelism across merge operations. We have different blocks working on different merge operations, but then also within a merge operation, we have multiple blocks working. Uh, and as, as we proceed, we're going to have fewer merge operations being done in parallel. So we have less parallelism across the merge operations, but we're going to have more parallelism within the merge operation. So for the later steps, we're going to have more parallelism within merge operations. Okay? Is this clear? Any questions? All right. Well, then, uh, so what we covered today is we covered Radix sort and we covered merge sort. Um, and, uh, and that is all that I have for today. Uh, does anybody have any final questions before we end? Um, yes, Professor, can you go back to the last slide uh, for Radix sort? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, is it possible in this case to get even better memory coalescing? So instead of arranging the the uh, the buckets uh, in this way, why don't why don't we write everything to global memory from uh, from the block uh, from the yeah, for each block to its corresponding uh, location in global memory? And then we do some kind of operation with a stride or something like that, and and uh, that way we would be able to 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 coalesce the the memory and, and update it after each uh, stride jump. Yeah, I'm not sure. How so I'm, not, I'm not sure what you mean by that, but uh, it, 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 if I can if I can guess or speculate what you what you're what you're driving at. Um, if you want to put this all in global memory and put this all in global memory and then somehow shuffle the elements around, well, that's going to require uncoalesced access, right? So what we're doing here is exactly that. We're, we're, we're shuffling these elements around so that they're sorted in the final destination array. Okay, because if I want to I will take these and store them to global memory in a coalesced way, I'm going to take these and I store them all to global memory in a coalesced way, when I want to come and shuffle them around, I'm going to have to read them back and then store them in an uncoalesced way. Right? So I might as well just do it directly. 
Okay, so basically, it 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 only uh, what I said only delays the coalescing, right? Exactly. Uh, the, yes. the, the, yeah. Yes, okay. you're gonna have to pay the uncoalesced axes anyways. But here, fortunately, these axes are actually quite coalesced. Okay, I see. Thank you. Okay, so if I have four or eight buckets, and I have you know I'm gonna have more than four or eight warps inside of my thread block, if each Warp takes a bucket and stores it to global memory. My coalescing behavior is actually going to be pretty good. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, you're welcome. Any questions? Okay, if not, then that's all for today, and I'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.